All right, good evening. I'm an instructor and researcher at Harvard Medical School, and tonight I'm going to tell you about why we need crowdsourced data in public health. So one of the founders of this field of public health and epidemiology was this physician from the 1800s, uh, pictured here. His name is John Snow. And before we really knew what caused diseases and about bacteria and viruses, he took a map of London and showed that it was the so uh, contaminated water sources which were the uh, source of the disease cholera in London at the time. And what I'd like you to think about during this talk is what if Jon Snow and his contemporaries had tools like mobile phones? What else could we learn? So the state of infectious diseases around the world today is dramatically shifting. So even in about the last 15 years, there have been many infectious diseases that are new and have emerged, and many that are re-emerging in places they thought were previously under control. Similarly, with chronic diseases, even in about the same time period, the prevalence of diseases like obesity has shifted dramatically in many countries all around the world. The way we get data today in public health is very chain of command. So there are many steps between when the public reports that they're sick up to when it comes to bodies that are actionable, like the WHO or the UN. And so there's a lot of issues with this chain of command structure. We lose out. We lose out on knowing when things happen. So this is the number of people going in to see their doctor for things like for flu in the United States, and that increases in the fall. But around times like Thanksgiving and New Year's, people don't go into the doctor. They're busy doing other things, so we don't know who's sick. Also, where? Where things happen that's captured by field reports on the ground, that measurement dramatically differs from what diseases are reported based on news media, because of course that depends on where the news media outlets are and where they're reporting from. So I'm an engineer by training. In graduate school, I spent a lot of years building devices to kind of bypass this whole system and go right to individuals, and sometimes it got pretty messy. But I soon realized that there's a lot of other data sources now that we can use to get information directly from individuals, whether that's through social media, or reporting through mobile phones, looking what people are searching for on the internet. There's many different data sources. But of course, with all these data sources, there are a lot of issues to consider. First of all, there's definitely an issue of privacy in health. So we want to take actionable insights, but without really infringing on the uh, privacy of any individual person. Looks like more than 15 seconds. So I'll tell you a little bit more. So, so we don't really don't want to infringe on people's privacy. So we all know about this, what's happened recently. And there are other issues to consider. So when we get a lot more data, we also have issues of noise. So we have data that you know, is just not relevant to our question at hand and some things that are what our signal is. And so we have to use mathematical techniques, just like we already do in engineering, to optimize those signal-to-noise ratios. But at the same time, by going right to individuals, there's a lot of things we can measure that we were previously unable to measure, such as aspects of the environment and other social factors that actually relate to disease and especially chronic diseases. We can also reach a lot more people compared to the tens, hundreds, and thousands of people reached by current studies. We can look at things in very real time. So here's me tweeting about this talk. You can see I was up pretty late working on it one night. And we can get very specific geo-resolution so we know exactly where things are happening. So considering all of these challenges and benefits, we have had many successes. For example, we've taken data from Facebook and shown that within New York City, neighborhood to neighborhood, in places where there's a higher prevalence of obesity, there's actually a higher number of people who are interested in sedentary activities like watching television online, and so that's relating your online social environment to your health outcomes. In places where we actually don't even have these metrics, we can go right to individuals and ask them for information. So this is the state of malaria surveillance in India right now. Gray areas are where there's a lot of uncertainty. So these are places we can go right to the individuals to ask them for information about their disease status. And finally, even in the U.S., we, have, we ask individuals weekly about what flu symptoms they have at flunearyou.org. 
And we find that this correlates in time with what the CDC finds for the number of people going into their physicians. And really, people just like being a part of a system. They like being involved. And perhaps that makes them more proactive. So once the public has access to all of these tools to provide information directly, they can speak to all of these bodies and work in tandem with the existing systems. So all of the data that we have is used a lot right now for advertisements and marketing. And it's about time we demanded that it's used for something that will help all of us. And that's why we need crowdsourced data in public health. Thank you.